I spent 1560 hours coding this app right here and today I am finally revealing to you the app that we found it with two co-founders and that after six months of coding and thousands of hours ended up completely failing. I spent around six months working on this at around 60 hours a week, sometimes even more than that, which totals roughly 1,560 hours. Although we had two technical founders coding this, so really the total amount of time that has been put into this app was more than like 3,000 hours. Unfortunately, at the end, the app, despite all of this time put into it, absolutely sucks balls. No one really ended up using it. It's just like very confusing, complicated. But throughout this process, I did learn a lot of lessons. So today I make this video to you so that you don't have to make the same mistakes as I did. Today, what we will do is first of all, I will sort of explain on the software engineering side, like how this app is architected, how we built out of this. Then I will actually dive in and show you what a real code base for like a real tech startup looks like. And then at the end, I will give you some of the biggest code coding slash software engineering lessons that I learned from this process that I think would be really useful to you if you're a beginner software developer, whether you're actually interested in building a startup yourself or if you just want to become a software engineer in general. So first, let's talk about the architecture. So I've sort of drawn this diagram of the architecture of this application. By the way, if you're wondering what the app actually does, what it looks like is something like this. It's basically a side panel on your computer where you can essentially create these boxes where these boxes will contain tabs for your browser, apps that you have open on your computer, and even files that you might wanna open up, let's say when you're working on a specific project, where the idea was that one box would represent, like for example, one project. Let's say you're working on a coding project, and when you work on that project, you might wanna have certain apps, like your code editor and things like this open on your computer, and also some tabs that include like documentation and like whatever research you're doing and like certain files, for example, some like note file or whatever. But then let's say right now you're working on this project and you want to take a break and you want to go do something else. Like you have a different project that you're working on in parallel. It's sort of cumbersome to close all of this stuff manually and then open up all the other stuff from the second project or something else that you're working on. So the idea was that you could just click on these boxes in this side panel and it would automatically open up on your screen all the stuff that is essentially contained within this box. Now this is a brief explanation. If it sounds complicated to you, that is exactly why the app failed. No one really understood how to use this and it didn't really work as well as it should, but that is a story for another day. But now getting into the technical side. So I've sort of drawn this diagram to show you like just how many pieces there are in this software. And by the way, before we even talk about this, if your app architecture starts to look something like this before you even have any paying users, you might want to consider if you're sort of overcomplicating things and if there would be like a simpler way to achieve what you're trying to do. But it ended up looking like something like this, where essentially at its core, we have a desktop application that represents the side panel that you see on your computer that you install either on your Mac or your Windows, which again had its own complications. And then we have a Chrome extension so for now, the app only works with a Chrome extension, would essentially get data about the tabs you have open on your computer and like send it to our app. And that would allow us to like open tabs for you, close tabs for you, store the tabs you had opened in certain boxes and things like this. Getting those two to work together was a whole another ordeal. And then we have a server where we have a database that stores like analytics data, your user data, and many other things. That was coded in Node.js. And basically we used JavaScript like and JavaScript frameworks for this entire project just to make it easier so that we have one language throughout the entire project across all these different things. And also because the main app that we were building, there is a JavaScript framework called Electron.js that is essentially designed to allow you to build cross-platform desktop applications. And we just determined that, that is the best framework to use rather than using something like Swift from Mac application or Kotlin or whatever they use for Windows applications. So we use that. And then inside of this desktop application itself, there is a front end and there is a back end. So if you have like an external server, which is this one right here, but then inside of the desktop app itself, there's like a back end and a front end. And inside of Electron JS, these are called the main process and the renderer process. And you can look at the docs to essentially learn more about how all of that works. The front end is built on React and we styled it with Tailwind CSS. And throughout this entire thing, we use 
TypeScript, and this is also when I learned the benefit of using TypeScript over JavaScript, like having the types and everything like that is actually very, very useful when you're debugging, like immediately if there's something wrong, the TypeScript will essentially warn you that, hey, you need to type here, like type of this function is not correct, things like this. So I actually highly recommend using TypeScript for your JavaScript projects if you have a project that's gonna become even remotely complex. So that was really great. And then the backend side of things also built in TypeScript. And essentially what this does is it communicates from the desktop app into the server. It handles payment logic. So we use Stripe. Stripe, by the way, Nick, insanely amazing platform for handling payments. So we essentially have a Stripe account for the business. And then there's like amazing developer documentation that can allow you to like accept payments and like put things behind a paywall and things like this. Now we never ended up using this because we never even got to the stage where this would become paid, but that is what was happening there. And then there were a lot of external APIs that we were communicating with. So we had to like get verified by the Google APIs and like all this kind of stuff that was again, a whole another ordeal. And then we had OAuth, which is where we handled like user accounts and things like this. So this is sort of how how it all ended up looking at. I guess the main thing I learned is that often these days when you're coding, the most difficult part isn't actually writing the code. It's like connecting all of these things together and doing all the configuration. ChatGPT can do so much of the writing of the code once you like can explain the logic to the AI in human language. Now, the next thing I wanna do is actually show you what the code base looks like. I'm not gonna go through all of this by any means because that would take like 10 hours. But essentially we have like a couple of different projects or like code bases within these applications. We have the main Boxio folder that includes basically the desktop application. Boxio was, by the way, the name of the app. Then we have the code for the server that we host on Verso, where also the database and things like that are hosted. And then we have the Chrome extension, which is the part that communicates to your browser. So inside of this Boxio folder, for example, we have SRC where most of the code is hosted. And then we have main and we have renderers. So main is again, so the backend side of this desktop application. And then we have renderer, which is the front end side. Inside of this renderer folder is basically just a React application that basically when you load up and you open this desktop application, it looks as if it's a web application because this is built basically so that when you open the desktop app, you like loads up like a browser instance, like a Chromium browser instance. And then on top of that, you have basically like a web app that you're running on top of it. So you basically just have a React project right here. You have app.tsx, which is like massive, and you have all these components. So really what I learned here is that when you're building something this big, and even if it's a bit smaller, organization becomes super important. And many beginners might be like, well, how do you know that you're organizing the correct way, things like this? What I really learned is that it's less important that you're organizing like correctly, like there's really no rules at the end of the day. They're just best practices that you can follow if you want. But really what's most important is that if you have multiple people working on it, that is logical and that you all agree and understand how it is organized. Like you all follow the same rules, no matter what those rules are in terms of organization. We just decided to do it like this, where all of the different components for React are in this components folder. And then there's like different subfolders for all different components. And sometimes when these components would become too big, we would literally like just spend a couple of hours to like reorganize the code to like make this as modular as possible, where for like a React component, if there's some part of it that's clearly like a distinct component, we would take that, put that into a separate file and things like this. So just, just to make this easier to read because it's surprising how much time you end up wasting just like finding stuff from all these files if your files become way too long and way too big. And this is really where I again saw the benefit of really modularizing your code, really taking small pieces and putting them into separate files and properly organizing them. So really, again, here we just have like React components, all these kind of things. And then we have like helpers that just have like small reusable components, like an app icon that we can use whenever we show like icons and things like this. And then we have like analytics that is then talking to our like analytics provider, which is Mixpanel, where we learn like, okay, how many people use these? How do they use these things like this? This is also like super important if you're building something serious because you want to understand, okay, how are people using it? How many of them are using it and things like this? Then we have a separate database on the front end as well that is storing certain stuff about the state and things like that. So a lot of stuff going on here. And then we have the main channel that essentially is the server side where you have like, for example, here APIs like talking to OAuth for the user data, talking to Drive, talking to Stripe, like all these kind of things. 
And then we have all these different folders for essentially different parts of our server. So this is, for example, for managing the windows of the user's computer. This is for managing the file system, for monitoring performance, all these kind of things. So a lot going on here. And then obviously we have the server itself that is inside of Vercel. And we have the Chrome extension where you have these tab controllers, like all this kind of stuff. Again, I don't know if you would find it useful for me to go through this in more detail, but it would basically just take a very long time, but that's just to show how big these code bases can get and how important it is that you and your co-founders or your team or whatever agree on exactly how all of this is organized. So you know where to put things, where to find things when your team adds something to the code and it all makes sense for all of you. So with all of that said, I now want to go into a couple of the coding and software engineering lessons that I learned from this process. The first thing and the main lesson is that no one, literally no one, not a single soul gives a damn about your code. What I mean about this is that it's a particular thing with software engineers, like technical people, is that we become very obsessed about our code. We're like spending all this time to like optimize the code, make the code like really pretty or like add all these complex features because it's technically so cool that we have a Chrome extension that's speaking to this desktop application and then we have a database and all of this, but your users don't care. All your users care about is does the app work? Does it solve the problem that it's supposed to solve? And is it easy to use? Like no one sees what is there behind the scenes. If the app doesn't work, like no user is going to care. Like, oh, but it has this really cool architecture and it's like took a lot of work for us to make it. Like no one cares. So if you want to build an app that makes money, don't become obsessed with your code. Become obsessed with solving problems for your users. Lesson number two, get the app out early. We ended up spending four months before we even gave this to anyone. Now, that was largely because, and maybe this is just an excuse, is because it ended up being so much more complex technically than we ever anticipated. Like we tried to give it to people after like two months, which to be fair is still way too long, but it just ended up not working at all because the way we had thought about building this at first ended up being the completely wrong route. So we had to waste a lot of time, which is, I guess, down to our inexperience, reorganizing everything, like changing the entire direction of the application and things like this. But when you're building something, don't try to build something that is gonna take months and months to build unless you are already a successful founder where you can get funding for it and like everyone already trusts you and things like this because you're a first time founder. No one's gonna give you funding most likely unless you can already show that you're making money, that you have active users and things like this. And it's really not worth it to spend months building something with no income, no money, like all the uncertainty. If you again, don't already have money, if you don't already have a business, obviously I was in the fortune position that I already had a successful business that was already making me money that I was able to run at the same time as building this. So I wasn't like going broke or anything. But for, for example, for my co-founders, that was not the case. So I would highly recommend just choosing for your first business something that you can launch quickly. That you can start giving to people as early as possible so that you can actually see whether it has potential or not. Because 99% of the time, it's going to fail anyway. So it's better to fail fast, fail early, so that you can then move on to the next thing as fast as possible, and then try the whatever 10 times it's gonna take you to try before you eventually succeed. Tip number three, do not make a desktop app. Just don't, like the technical difficulties and everything, like the configuration of getting all of this to work, like a cross-platform desktop app that was again, like communicating all these different things. Please don't do it. If you're gonna do them, something, just make a web app. It's so much easier. Uh, trust me, just don't make a desktop app unless you really, really have to. Lesson number four, AI really is magic. This took us this long, even with access to AI, ChatGPT, we were using all of the latest AI models and everything to essentially generate most of the code for us, yet still it took this long. I cannot imagine how long this would have taken if we tried this like a couple of years ago when all these LLM models were not yet available. So literally whatever you're building, abuse the hell out of AI because if you're building something valuable, really the value doesn't come from the code that you generate, it comes from having the right idea, knowing what to code and like designing the architecture in the right way and having user experience in mind, like really thinking, how do I want to code its application so that it's actually useful for people. Abuse AI because you can get stuff out so much quicker because of it. The next lesson is that having a co-founder really makes things a lot more fun. If I'd been building this on my own, I would have probably gone crazy. Now, sure, if it's something that's more simple, that 
is actually very quick to ship, then maybe you don't need this, but especially if it's something more complex, then having someone that you're coding with that also understands the struggles that you're going through when you're stuck on some configuration bug for like two days, then it just makes it a lot more fun. It was really cool that myself and the other technical founder in the team, we were all both like very chill. Whenever things were going wrong, wherever there were bugs and whenever the process absolutely sucked because you will have those moments, we could both just like laugh at it together, but make sure to pick your co-founders correctly because picking the wrong co-founder, which I know from a lot of the stories I've heard, can be the worst possible decision you make. So pick someone you trust and someone that you know is not going to fold under pressure because you're going to have a lot of moments where things are not going well and you need to have someone who is able to go through that stress and essentially not crumble. And the most important tip, think from the perspective of the user. And this is what everyone says, but like, it's actually pretty hard in the moment to like, remember like, okay, is this actually adding value? Is this actually making the app better for the user? And especially in the beginning, focus very, very narrowly on the core problem that you're trying to solve. Don't think about adding this and that feature. Like when you're in the process, like you're in the moment, you're thinking of all these different features, or oh, it could have this, it could have that, it could have that. But most of the ideas that you come up with are actually required for the actual app to function and for it to solve the actual core problem that you're trying to solve. What you first wanna do is just make sure it solves the core problem that you're trying to solve very, very well, and then you give it to people. And then, only then, if they like it, they keep using it, they keep asking for more, then you start adding new features and things like this. Because if the core value proposition of your business doesn't work, none of these extra features matter. And it's just gonna lead you to the situation that we ended up in, where you end up spending months and months building all these features that at the end of the day, no one's going to end. That was my experience, but I am not giving up. Like this was just my first try. I failed, which was obviously expected. And I'm already working on the next thing where I hopefully am not making the same mistake. So I will update you on all the progress on that, on this channel and everything like that. And with that said, if you wanna see another video where I talk more about why the app fails, things like this, you can watch this video right here. With that said, I will see you in the next one.